Well, hey, Oak Point family, one of our favorite things to do is to take family bike rides. And, and we live in Green Oak, so it's about seven miles from our building. And, and one of the things that we love is to end up at a specific spot. Our spot this summer has been Mickey's Ice Cream. If you have never been, I would ask that you would invite uh, me and my family and uh, maybe we'll pay. We can, you know, rock, paper, scissors for it. But, but here's what we love. The girls love getting cookie dough flurries. I enjoy a flurry with chocolate ice cream, peanut butter cup, and brownies. Two spoons, my wife, myself, sometimes Paxton, our son. But here's what we like to do. We, we like to sit then and have some conversations. And what takes place is typically um, a little bit of rants and stuff about the day. But, but this particular time, it ended last week. And we were sitting around and what, what came up was, would you rather? Now, anybody can play Would You Rather. It doesn't matter if you're five years old or if you're 85 years old. What I love about Would You Rather is that it is consequences. And then the more that you go, they actually increase. And then the severity increases. And then it's just death and destruction following that. So here's a couple that came out. And I would love for you to play along with us. One is, would you rather speak all languages or be able to speak to all animals? It's a tough one. Would you rather be the funniest person in the room or be the most intelligent? And here's my favorite that happened at Mickey's on the table. It was this. Would you rather be poked in the eye or punched in the nose? Now, that's a tough one. And, and each one of my children responded differently, and it took them a long time. But here's what it seems to happen when I read through the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus seems to summarize everything into a would you rather. Would you rather have life, connection with Jesus, life, peace, or would you rather have death and destruction? That is what he asks us. And it seems so simple and we often miss, but here's the truth of it. He asks you this simple question. Do you want me, the rock, or do you want life that is shifty and often sandy? You see, Jesus is a master teacher and he comes along and he summarizes everything that he's taught into a few stories. He's like an artist painting this beautiful picture and he says, hey, there's some gates and there's some paths. There's some good fruit and there's some bad fruit. There's some wise builders and there's some foolish builders. And what he does, he gives us this two option thinking saying, here's this way or this way and you choose. And what he does with that, he actually exposes the motivations and the intentions of our hearts to say, do you want life or do you want death? So I want to jump in with you. Open your Bible uh, or uh, on you know, whatever uh, device you're using and, and open it up to Matthew 7. And we're going to look at verse 13 through 15. And we'll just continue on all the way through the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says this, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many will enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life and few find it. You see, to follow Jesus is actually to take the road less traveled. It's this small path that's often ignored because there's, there's too much at stake. There's, there's too much surrender of the will. There's too much mystery. Sometimes it's too much money or it's too much time. Um, that goes out of myself. And, and some of us, we just deem it too difficult to go. Yet, it leads to a much greater life than we could ever imagine. So the truth for us in this, of this wide gate, narrow gate, wide path, narrow path, is this. To follow Jesus is costly. A couple chapter later uh, in Matthew, he says this, whoever doesn't take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And whoever finds their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. To follow Jesus is costly. He actually demands that we turn from our sin and we pursue him. He, he seems that by the end of this, he says, hey, at the end of the day, only a few decide to follow me, but they will be devoted. And he goes on and he says, hey, I want to tell you about some things to look out for. And he says, there's some, some good fruit and there's some bad fruit. There's some wise people, some false people, and some, some terrible people. And he says this in verse 15, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. 
Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, not every good tree or every good tree bears good fruit, but every bad tree bears good fruit. A good tree can't bear bad fruit and a bad tree can't bear good fruit. Every tree that doesn't bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And he repeats this phrase again. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruit. Jesus says, hey, there's a couple people you need to look out for. There's bad fruit, and that means there's, there's some false prophets that are gonna be out there. And, and a false prophet is somebody who, they're speaking things, but yet on the inside, they're completely empty. But then you have these, these good prophets, so to say, they're teaching things, but the way that you can determine is by the fruit of their life. Because by their fruit, you will recognize them. So the good fruit is the fruit of the spirit that comes out. There's love and there's joy and there's peace and there's patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You find that in Galatians 5. But the fruit is actually, it's good and not only benefits you as the believer, it actually benefits all these other people. But the truth that Jesus puts here is he says, watch out for the wolves, right? Watch out for those who are producing bad fruit from their lives because they want to deceive you. And the way that they deceive you is by their actions. Their teaching is this, but their lives live differently. So they're disobedient to Jesus' teaching. They don't do the will of God. They're empty on the inside and they just, they seek personal gain. You might know some of these people or you might see them on TV. Um, it's, it's easy sometimes to spot, but you, sometimes you just need to watch somebody. If you're like, oh, I'm unsure of that person, you, you watch the fruit that is produced by their life you look at their relationships, you look at, hey, what is coming out of that? Is it to benefit other people or is it for personal gain? And Jesus says, watch out for these wolves because they are here to deceive you. And when they deceive you, it, that actually leads to destruction. So Jesus says, hey, there's these false teachers, but there's actually another level. There's another layer that he wants to take us. And he says this in verse 21. He says, not every one of you who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not drive out demons in your name and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. This is probably the scariest set of scripture that I could ever, one, preach, but also um, believe and try to incorporate into my life because the last thing that I wanna do, because Jesus is speaking about the judgment, the last thing I wanna do is come before him and he says, Adam, you've done all these great things for me, but you've done them apart from me. See, you wanna drive out demons, you wanna prophesy in my name, you wanna perform miracles, and these are all really incredible things but if we do them apart from knowing Jesus, they're empty. Because Jesus will say, I never knew you apart from me. So there, he's actually saying that there's a chance that we can do the works of God without actually knowing the heart of God. Mighty works are not proof of God's will, but intimacy is. And so the truth for us in this text is intimacy comes before action in God's kingdom. Intimacy comes before action in God's kingdom. So it's not just about blindly doing good works to say, oh, that's a really good thing to do. I'm going to go ahead and do it. No, Jesus says, uh-uh. It starts with knowing me before you can make me known. And these fake followers might be like the false prophets because the false prophets are out there, remember, they're just saying things to deceive people, but you can see it by their fruit. Well, these fake disciples are actually doing the good things, but Jesus says, it's not just about what you do, it's about knowing me. So intimacy comes before action in God's kingdom. And I believe as followers of Jesus, this is one of the most difficult things for us to not only believe, but to also live out in our life. So Jesus now comes to the culmination of the entire sermon. He takes everything that's taught in Matthew 5, Matthew 6, Matthew 7, and he brings it right here in a simple parable that most people, whether you're a Christian or not, whether you know about scripture or not, or even Christianity, they've, they've heard this parable in some way or form. And it's the wise and the foolish builders. You see, there's two builders and there's two responses and there's two outcomes. 
Listen to it with me. Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew against this rock, this house, yet it didn't fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. You see, the rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew, and they beat against this house, and it fell with a great crash. You see, we love sand. I really enjoy sand. I like going to the beach. We can go over to Lake Michigan. We can play. It's only two hours away, and you can make sand castles, and you build them, and it's great. It's good fun, again, no matter what the age. But Jesus is saying sand is a really terrible thing to build on. Because Jesus was a master teacher, but not only that, he was a master carpenter, a master builder. He grew up year after year working with his dad, Joseph, and they built. And during this time in the hot, hot summer days, you had the Sea of Galilee, and on that sand, it would be really hard, and it would get packed down on top, and and people would come, and they would say, man, this is a really hard surface. I can build on this. But then what happens was the rain would come in the rainy season and it would wash it away. And the house was completely demolished. Well, a wise builder would come along and say, man, this seems really, really hard. This seems like a good surface, but I know it's not. I know what's gonna come because the rain always comes. And so what I'm gonna do, I'm actually gonna build, I'm gonna dig in through the sand and get down to the bedrock and it's gonna be solid and perfect and I can build my house here. So when the storms come, because they always come, I can build on the rock and my house will not crash. See, there's two builders. We have the foolish builder. And Jesus says, the foolish builder, it has nothing to do with building houses and has everything to do with our life. See, the foolish build with distraction and they build with hurry and they build without intention, and they build with worry, and you can add things. You actually can't have the perfect thing to describe it because it's always shifting, just like sand is. Go out to the sand dunes, they're always changing. And that is building your life on sand. It will shift and move, and those are the signs of our culture. And guys, right now, it is so sandy. It is so sandy, and it's shifty, and it's uncertain because there's COVID and there's racial division, there's family tensions. It's an election year. It's a works-based, empty religion to build on something that has to do with what I can do and how I can perform and nothing to do with grace. Building on sand is about money and pay cuts and job loss and having security in that. Or it's, you know, the sandiness of school starting in two days. What in the world are we gonna do? So in times of uncertainty, we must focus on what is certain and secure. And that is the rock, Jesus himself and the word. So then Jesus now comes to the wise builder. And the wise build by believing and obeying. The wise build by believing and obeying. You see, we believe who Jesus is. We believe that he's the son of God. We believe that he came to rescue us. We believe that if we actually take his words and believe scripture and we actually live it out, it is building our life completely on him. So when we believe who Jesus is and that he's actually done what he said he was gonna do, we can obey his word because guess what? The storms will come. Life will be crazy. There will be something else next year that takes and tries to wipe us out. But when we can build by believing and obeying, we actually put it into practice. The word put into practice or make or do, it's the same word. It means obey. It means actually to execute what is put before you. So if Jesus in his word says, hey, um, here's an entire sermon, three chapters on what I want you to do. And it has everything to base based on who I am and what I'm going to do on the cross for you and what I've done for you on the cross, live this out. And when we can do that, we actually execute this. He promises us life. 
starting now and for all eternity. And that is our value as a church. It's a value, listen. And listen isn't just simply to hear the word. It's actually to put it into practice. James 1 says this, don't merely listen to the word and deceive yourself. Don't be like the false prophets. Mm, Do what it says. Jesus says this way, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you wanna show that you love Jesus, do what he says. The same way that when a coach or a teacher or a parent or anybody comes to you, if you wanna show them that you care about them and they give you a task to do, you listen and you obey. It's simple. It's what we're called to do. But it gets really, really difficult when it has to do with our own lives and not about just doing something at work or on the playing field. So even when it doesn't make sense and you don't understand it, you obey Jesus because he loves you. Even when it hurts too much and you don't think that you have the strength, you obey Jesus because he died for you. And even when people around you say it's foolish, you obey Jesus because he says it's worth it. And he proved it by rising from the dead for you. So the wise build by believing and obeying. Are you wise or are you foolish? So I'm telling you to obey. So you're like, okay, this is great. But but what's the outcome? What actually happens in my life if I will believe in Jesus and actually obey what he says? Well, he tells us. You will be on the narrow path and few will follow with you, but guess what? You'll be committed and you can go side by side for the sake of the gospel. The the other promise is you will bear good fruit and it's not only a fruit for yourself, benefit to your own life, you will benefit everybody around you. You will be a blessing in your neighborhood and you will be secure when the storms come because storms always come. So how do we build How do we put God's word into practice? Well, we do it with one rock at a time, right? Because often, if we're honest with ourselves, we have one foot here and we have one foot here. And there's parts of our life that are so sandy that if anything came in, we would crumble because of the storm and the pressure. But there's other parts of our life where it's solid and secure, And so I believe Jesus comes in and says, I'm gonna give you my spirit and we're gonna do it one rock at a time. The big word for that in the Bible is sanctification. And so what we do, let me fall over here. We take one rock and as you read God's word and he tells you what to do, he gives you a practice and you obey it, guess what happens? You set this down. And the more that there's sand, the Holy Spirit will come in, he will convict you. And you will take one rock and you will move out that sand and you will put a rock down. And you do that over and over and over. And so anytime that he gives you the word of God and you're reading it and you're doing it and you're obeying it, guess what happens? You begin to build on the rock. And so you replace what's sandy with what's secure. So how do we do this? We have to read and study and meditate God's word regularly. You're like, well, Adam, that's really, that's simple and so elementary. It is so elementary. Elementary kids are being able to do it. We as adults should be able to do it. And so I encourage you, get a study Bible. If you don't have a study Bible, go on Amazon right now and get a study Bible. ESV is probably my favorite because in that there are study tools and there's commentary and there's Bible dictionary, there's maps. There's all these things that can help you understand the word of God and live it out. If you're like, well, I don't actually know where to start. Well, maybe start by reading the Sermon on the Mount all the way through again and again and again. Anytime Jesus gives you an action, you do it. Because here's the truth. And this was reality in my life when I became a Christian in high school. I didn't know how to follow Jesus because I didn't know what he told me to do. But the more I started sitting down and reading the word, I began to understand and then I would actually be convicted and be like, oh, this is a big sandy part in my life. I need to replace it with a rock. And that brings us to the second thing. When there's an action that Jesus tells us to do in the word, we do it immediately, right? So when hatred rises up, you have a choice to choose forgiveness, right? When lust comes in your mind and you wanna act on it, you can actually choose purity. Now, when there's worry, you can choose trust And when you just want to control something, you can actually surrender and you can pray. Adam Mashney told me about a book. It's called uh, The 10-Minute 
or the, I'm sorry, the 10 second rule, 10 minutes, far too long. The 10 second rule. You have 10 seconds to come in to actually choose to say, I'm gonna follow Jesus in this. Because most stats would say, if you don't obey after 10 seconds, you're probably not gonna do it. So again, not scripture in that sense, but in this sense, if you know what Jesus is telling you to do, you can act on it. And you're like, well, I don't have the strength. He gives you his spirit. Right? You have dynamite, the Holy Spirit living inside of you to obey the word of God. So as you read and study the word of God, and then Jesus gives you actions, then you do it immediately. Then that will build a solid foundation in your life, replacing what's sandy with what's solid. And that brings us to the last one. When storms come, be intentional with what you secure yourself to. When storms come, because they always do, be intentional with what you secure yourself to. So a situation rises up. What does God's word say about it? And if it, there's something specific in God's word, then you do it. There are times when the Bible seems a little gray or you're like, I don't know if Jesus directly talks about this. Well, then that's where you need community and you need um, trusted people who are godly around you. And you can say, hey, I'm really struggling with this or I need to make a decision about this. Can you pray with me? What do you think about this? And then, because at least what I know, when the storm's happening all around me, I can't see through the storm. I can't see through the rain, but somebody has a different perspective and they can come in and say, ooh, God's word says this, or hey, I really, uh, from godly wisdom, I think this, and we need that. So be intentional with what you secure yourself to. It is impossible to obey the word of God without Jesus. He makes it all possible, right? Because he has come and he has authority. It ends, the Sermon on the Mount ends and Jesus finishes and the crowds were amazed. Very few times in scripture does it say the crowds are amazed because Jesus had authority like nobody ever had. He had a weight to his life like nobody ever had. And so he comes on the scene and people wanna follow him because his life matched up with his teaching unlike the Pharisees. And Jesus could come and say this because he was God's son. And he could do this because he loves you. And he proved it by taking your sin upon himself and taking it to a cross. And not only that, he, he took your sin, but in exchange, he gave you his righteousness and a perfect relationship with God. But, but Jesus doesn't promise an easy life. He promises a purposeful life, one that has meaning. And Jesus doesn't promise wealth and comfort. He promises his presence no matter what happens. So Jesus says, will you surrender your life? Will you confess that I am Lord and follow me? So surrendering your life to Jesus, whether this is right now for the very first time or you've done it decades ago, this is an intentional step in building your life on him. So do you believe that Jesus came to rescue you from sin and death? Do you believe that Jesus came to rescue you into a right relationship with him? Then obey, surrender your heart, surrender your mind, your body and your will to him. If you have no idea what that looks like or how to do it, I'd ask that you would connect with us, right? You can go on our, uh, you could pause this video, you could go to the connection page and we would love to talk with you because we want you to believe in Jesus so that you can obey Jesus. And we're gonna head into a communion time. And that is one of the ways that we go from shifting sand to secure foundations is by communion because it focuses us on the body of Jesus and the blood of Jesus. So before we move into it, I'd love for us to examine our lives. So what are you building your life on? What are you securing your life to? What sin do you need to confess to Jesus right now? What can you thank God for? There will be scripture on the screen for you to meditate on. And I'll come up in a second after you pause your video. 
and we will take the elements together. that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you. Eat this, do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup and he said, this is the blood of my new covenant shed for you. So when you drink of it, drink of it in remembrance of me. So I invite you to eat the bread that represents Jesus' body broken for you and drink the juice of his blood that was shed for you. And in closing, Jesus has the Sermon on the Mount. He says, would you rather, would you rather have life Or would you rather have death? Would you rather be a wise builder who builds their house on what is solid and secure? Because the wise build by believing and obeying. Or would you rather be a fool who builds their house on what is shifty and sandy? My friends, the choice is yours. So may we build by believing and obeying.
God, that we would be a people who put our hope and our trust in you and we build our lives on that firm foundation so when the rains come and the storms rage, we can stand firm because you hold us up. Because what we've practiced by being obedient to your word has given us strength and hope and a firm foundation. So we just pray, Lord, that you would send us to our neighbors, to our workplaces, to our schools, and into our communities with that firm foundation leading and guiding us every step of the way so that people, when they look at us, they would see something that says, I want to be part of that. God, that's the kind of church we want to be. We love you, Lord. Renew us and make us new day by day as we stand on the firm foundation of your word. And we pray this in your beautiful name. Amen. Thanks for closing out our Upside Down series with that message, Pastor Adam. If you're not yet connected at Oak Point, a simple way to do that is to fill out our online connection card. And your digital bulletin is right at the top under Connect. Filling out that card means one of our community pastors will reach out to you. And if you want to request prayer, there's another link in that section called Prayer Request. Fill that form out and your request will be sent confidentially to our prayer coordinator, Beth Swiss. This fall, we have some great group life opportunities where you can engage with others and grow spiritually and emotionally healthy. Let's start with our life studies. Each one is a group learning environment that allows you to take a deeper dive into spiritual, emotional, or financial health. This fall, our life studies will be online, conducted via Zoom. They include Listening Well, Living Well, Loving Well, and Financial Peace University. But if you're dealing with a specific struggle that is holding you back, a renewed group might be right for you. These focus groups help you pursue spiritual growth and healing from some of life's larger challenges. Fall groups include divorce care, grief share, men's integrity, parents of adult prodigals, her story, and journey to heal. Some of our renewed groups will meet on site while others are online. Check the registration to see details. You can find links to everything else we've talked about today in our digital bulletin, including saving a seat for next weekend's indoor services, Adventureland registration, life studies and renew groups, online giving, and more. Again, that digital bulletin is found at oakpoint.org info. Next weekend, we get to hear from our newest community pastor. John Weidman, who shepherds our East community, will challenge us with a message on how to go beyond just surviving during difficult times and really learn to thrive. His text is from the letter of 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7-11. through 11. Read that this week. Then, we'll see you either indoors or online next week.